All right, let's go ahead and get started. So again, hello everyone, and welcome to today's webinar presentation titled, Looking Beyond SQL and NoSQL, What Will Data Access Look Like? Brought to you by Faircom. I would like to introduce you to our two presenters today. First, we have Shane Johnson, who is the head of marketing at Faircom. Shane is a former Java developer and architect specializing in distributed systems. Prior to joining Faircom, he led technical marketing for Red Hat, followed by product marketing at Couchbase and MariaDB. We also have Mike Bowers here today, who is the chief architect at Faircom. And Mike oversees product strategy and innovation. He has 25 plus years of experience in software development and architecture, and is a member of the INCITS Technical Committee for SQL and GQL. At this time, I'd like to pass it off to Faircom for the presentation. Thank you and welcome everyone. You know, as mentioned, my name is Shane. Uh, and to give you maybe a little bit of context, because I think this will you know, kind of help, help everyone understand my perspective uh, on the topic today. You know, I did spend um, the first half of my career as a Java developer and architect. So in terms of databases, I was obviously a user for a long time. And then, of course, I spent some time at Couchbase uh, on the NoSQL side of things, particularly a little bit you know, early um, in that rise. And then more recently, I spent some time at MariaDB, uh, where we've seen a resurgence in relational. Um, so I think about those two things a lot. And one of the things that I get excited about is where we're going uh, and where there's potential. And we're going to talk a lot about that today. But before I do, um, I wanted to see, Mike, if you want to say hi to everyone. You bet. I'm Mike Bowers, and it's great to be here with you today. Shane's going to do all the talking. At the end, I'll answer questions. Um, so. Be sure to ask all the questions you want so we can um, get those addressed because there's some really good information Shane has to share. Thank you. I'd like to think I'm pretty smart, um, but Mike is, is really the smart one. Uh, so don't hold back on your questions. However deep or technical um, or thorough it may be, um, that's why we're fortunate to have Mike with us. So a little bit about the agenda. I am planning to do a live demo at the, hand, at the end, um, take a look at some code. Um, so we have a, a little bit here, uh, making a sacrifice for our demo gods. Um, hopefully everything turns out well. Uh, but when we get back to the meat, uh, we'll do a little bit about the history. Um, and I think this will make sense when I get into it because, because some of what we'll see in the future uh, and what we can do actually stems from things that we've done in the past, um, sometimes long ago and, and maybe forgotten. Uh, but you know they can make make a comeback uh, or, or find you know, value today. Uh, then we'll kind of do a, a little quick tour uh, of what I mean by database APIs. You know what's what's happening out there. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about what's next. Um, so given some of that history, given some of the APIs, you know, and how databases are built. Um, how can we take advantage of that to improve life for developers? Um, I'm going to make a little pit stop on microservices. Uh, I'm really I'm passionate about that space, and I think there's some interesting things regarding databases in microservices architecture. Um, in and of itself could be an entire presentation, but we'll spend just a little bit of time there. Um, then we'll revisit our APIs. Um, just kind of give some broad strokes, you know, what they do when you'd want to use them. Uh, then we'll look a little bit farther, right? So we kind of have some, some near-term stuff that's happening. Uh, we have a little bit of historical stuff uh, that we can bring back and for good reason. And then there's also some new stuff that we're looking at too. Um, and then of course we'll do our live demo. I was gonna put a picture here and, and I forgot. So I, I can tell you what it is. Um, but you know, this is something I've had since I was a little kid. Um, and I don't know how many of you remember Toys R Us and its prime, uh, but all of us little kids would stare at you know, the expensive things in glass cabinets. I would be happy to go to Toys R Us just to, 
to look at it, um, play it at home. And I remember when I finally got it, it was essentially uh, my only Christmas gift. I don't know how it is in, ever in a household, but mine was generally you could ask for one big thing or you might get a whole bunch of small little things. This was my big thing. Uh, my sacrifice, had I remembered to put the picture here, it was going to be a copy, uh, my original copy of Alien Crush. Uh, so depending on you know, how old everyone is there in the audience uh, and how much you were into video games, Alien Crush was for the TurboGrafx-16, uh, which to me, as a developer and architect, it was by far the best video console of all time. Uh, and I think what was really fascinating, and, and we didn't really see it before or after, was the you know, expandability of it. Um, you could buy just one piece, right? the TurboGrafx-16. Then you could buy these various add-ons that plugged into a, a large port on the back, um, including a CD uh, drive. So it was the first system to let you play games on CDs, the first system to let you add memory yourself and the games were i thought were amazing at the time and, and even still to agree today because they're just they look like credit cards right there's just a, it's a small little um, piece of plastic probably about this similar you know length and width of a credit card but maybe just a little bit thicker um, and you can play them on anything you can play them on the console you can play them on the handhelds um, being in marketing i thought the branding and naming uh, was absolutely amazing Right, turbo everything, turbo graphics, turbo stick, turbo pad, um, pretty great. Um, so I thought it was awesome. Uh, and I like to at least start my webinars with something not quite as, as technical as where we're gonna go. Uh, feel free to use the questions though. I'm curious if anybody here remembers turbo graphics or had a turbo graphics, uh, but we can consider you know, my alien crush uh, to be today's sacrifice to the demo gods. Uh, so hopefully we can finish on a really great note. Getting back to the topic at hand, um, especially as we kind of dip our toes here into the history, uh, no doubt SQL has been around for a long time. Um, and I think you could argue that the vast majority of databases today are still relational databases. Um, Oracle, SQL Server on the proprietary front, Postgres and MySQL, on the open source front. Oh, but naturally, uh, you know, and I certainly remember this from my time at Couchbase, you know, NoSQL databases were a big disruption. Uh, I, you know, and arguably they were a reflection of changes in application development, you know, particularly the web and JSON becoming, you know, the new de facto standard there. Um, but, you know, one of the things I wanted to isolate for our purposes is they didn't implement SQL. Right. Instead, they chose to implement their own query APIs uh, for the most part. Right? I know there's some, some edge cases out there. And they weren't based on a relational model. Um, some like MongoDB went with JSON. Others like Cassandra went with kind of you know, wide table or wide column. And then you have some like Redis, which are various data structures. Um, so there's some, some big differences in how they approach things. But I would also say NoSQL existed long before MongoDB and really long before relational. Uh, you know, relational databases were not, not the very first databases. Uh, we had some databases early on. Um, the two examples I kind of put here were navigational and hierarchical. Um, you know, funny enough, uh, the source of these might surprise everyone, but IDS out of General Electric or IDMS out of BF Goodrich. Um, and then even IBM has a handful uh, of databases. And those, you know, IMS in particular still exist today, um, as do some variations of it. So these were, you know, these are out before relational um, and certainly out before the standardization of SQL. And so we think about CRUD, uh, for example, um, or we think about working you know, on, on individual rows or records, as you're going to hear me throughout this presentation say, um, you know, those operations were super fast in these databases. Um, but as SQL became increasingly popular, you know, these things 
you know, these types of databases and these types of APIs, they started to fade away, right? Or they ended up being, you know, kind of hidden, right? Abstracted uh, away. And then you had that other group, uh, particularly ISM databases. And you see a handful of examples in there, Berkeley DB, Informix, uh, Faircom DB, right? Formerly called c Ace. Uh, and interestingly enough, even databases like DB2, you know, while you work with a SQL, uh, underlying that um, is still ISAM. There was kind of a second generation effort by them called vSAM. Um, but, you know, it, it, it's interesting that what you saw is these, you know, the, some of the concepts of these databases, they essentially got pushed down into kind of the core. Uh, and then you had the SQL layer wrapped on top that hid the core. And, you know, the idea was that SQL is just going to be so easy. Uh, and, and in some ways, it certainly is. Uh, you know, I think off the top of mind, it's declarative instead of procedural. So when you write your query, you're essentially telling your database, hey, I want you to go do this. Now, those earlier databases, you had to specifically tell, you know, the database what to do every step of the way. Uh, and some of these CRUD APIs were actually file-based, right? They were closer to being uh, file handlers, if you will, than what we think of today as being the databases, and there was a little bit of a debate. I mean, and when that debate was over, um, developer productivity, it was decided this was more important than database efficiency. Um, and I think the general consensus was, you know, the performance of SQL, even in this early state, it's good enough. It's not great. It's not as fast as the other APIs, uh, but it's going to be good enough for now. Um, but there were still some exceptions, right? A lot of applications still continue to run with ISM databases, for example. They needed really high performance. Good enough is not going to work for them. Um, oftentimes, you know, there was a one-to-one -one relationship between the application and the database. Um, I think good examples might be, you know, commercial off-the-shelf software uh, or maybe software that's embedded and running on uh, machines. Um, so it's still still existed, even if a lot of us shifted to relational and SQL. And so kind of that brings me to, you know, this notion of internal database APIs. And this probably isn't going to be, you know, accurate for every database out there, but I think conceptually it's helpful. Uh, and I think up until today, you know, up until recently, with relational and NoSQL, you had two different uh, means to get at your data. You could choose SQL in the relational world, or you had you know, these native APIs for NoSQL databases. But if you kind of peel those off, um, you would find that within those database are you know, multiple layers of APIs. Might not be all of these, it could be a subset of these. And what happens is, you know, at, at, the, very, you know, at the very top, when we're working with SQL, uh, or the query APIs, we're kind of constrained uh, in what we can do and how we can access the data. Right? It's defined by the language. It's defined by the API. As you start to move down this track, you know you start to have fewer and fewer limitations. Um, you can get all the way to the bottom, you can more or less do whatever you want to do. And of course, the closer you move to the bottom, the faster the performance. Um, so when I was talking a minute ago uh, about some of those um, kind of first generation databases, they were probably, you know, arguably closer to the storage and file level APIs. So they were blazing fast um, in that regard. And so if I go through these you know, kind of a little bit quickly, I'm going to invert it and kind of work, you know, from the bottom on upward that these file APIs these are largely about you know reading and writing you know records and index entries in files and manually uh, and by manually i mean you know okay database open this file uh, update the record at this position you know close this file okay open this index file add a new entry uh, because we updated our data or update an entry, okay, close this file. Um, so you're really close to that file level, but it's really fast. 
And then if we bump it up a little bit into the storage API, uh, it's still CRUD, you know, on the, on the actual, you know, data and index files, but at least there's a little bit of, you know, grouping, if you were, a little bit of abstractions. So you don't necessarily have to tell it uh, what to do on each individual file, um, but you can say, hey, for our, you know, for this particular um, data, say the you know, products table, um, I want to update a record. And, and behind the scenes, you know, I want you to open the file, go to the right position, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so there's a little bit of sense in files, but it's a little bit easier to work with. When we bump up a level, we're now working with database objects uh, more instead of the underlying files. Um, so we can start to think in terms of tables and indexes and sessions and locks uh, and, and things in, in that regard. Right? We're, we're manually operating on those. If we bump up to record, uh, we now have a, a little bit of an abstraction. Um, we're now working very specifically on records and records have fields and I can choose to you know, modify those records. You know, a, little bit, you know, a little bit easier, I can filter them. I can filter those records. We can create indexes to help with that and to define you know, how the results should be sorted. But records, I would argue, don't know much about each other. Um, and that's where navigational comes in. Kind of a layer above that, that it now understands relationships. Uh, we might have one record that can point to another, and that one can point to another. Um, think of it in terms of your standard parent-child relationship. Um, an order has many items, uh, and employee has many paychecks, you know, things like that. And then, of course, we get to the SQL API. Um, and now we can do more sophisticated stuff like joins and aggregates, um, depending on your database, maybe even you know, temporal. Um, and, of course, that's through a language um, rather than an API. Um, this to be, you know, very much represents how we, you know, start at the very top uh, with a SQL query and go through its query parser, you know, optimizer, you know, the planner, uh, and then it's going to start working its way down eventually until that data is written to risk, written to disk, sorry, at the file API. The other thing that you know I think about is the stack also has to you know get taller, if you will. Um, SQL on down is particularly great for you know web applications as we think about it today, right? especially if you're a server side or back end developer. Um, and yes, historically you know, for desktop applications and so on. Um, but the web's a new platform uh, for you know all your front end developers out there, you know JavaScript frameworks. I, I put maturing, but they, they become complex and sophisticated. Uh, they become complete you know, frameworks. Uh, you have you know, Sophia and Jamstack uh, on the rise. I remember even back when I was a developer, we started to have discussions about service-oriented front-end architecture uh, and kind of this hope that uh, the view, if you will, in an MVC architecture could be completely extracted uh, from my web application and moved out. Um, and I could you know, really just treat my web application as a series of REST services. Um, or Jamstack, which is taking that a little bit farther, but also incorporates notions of you know, kind of building um, your site and deploying it with static HTML and CSS and then relying on JavaScript uh, for everything else. And then naturally, you know, desktop application after desktop application is being replaced with SaaS services across the board, across all industries. So I think it only, you know, not only makes sense, but it's becoming a requirement uh, to begin providing, you know, browser apps, if you will, uh, with direct access to the database you know, over HTTP um, through different protocols, you know, whether it's REST or RPC. And in a sense, for some applications, they may not need uh, an application server. And optionally, you know, I could see the value in it for DBAs too, particularly if you want to build, you know, say, a custom browser app for managing deployed databases and, you know, how they're deployed and, um, you know, things like that. And a few examples, at least on this last part, um, you do have things like Google Firebase, 
and MongoDB Realm, um, I would argue that they kind of, they were born of kind of that MBAS era. Um, and I, that's not really my area of expertise, so I didn't keep up with it, but I knew for a little while, um, this notion of mobile backend as a service um, started to pretty get pretty big. And um, this is because a reflection of everybody trying to build you know, native mobile apps um, very quickly. And then you have um, even another handful of databases out there, Fauna and RESTDB, um, pretty good examples of you know, being native to the cloud and pursuing you know, HTTP native you know, web APIs, uh, if you will. There's also various middleware, right? I put a couple examples here. There's plenty more um, that kind of sits between a browser and a database. So it's kind of handling um, the translation, if you will. But really what some of these are doing is they're still presenting you with a singular API, uh, which is most of the time SQL, um, but not always the case. Um, so you don't, still don't have a great deal of flexibility, right? Whatever API they choose, um, they're making that available to you. And the other thing that occurs to me when we talk about where things are going is, you know, we've always kind of taken issue with multi-model. Uh, it just doesn't resonate with me. And, and I think part of it has to do with the word model. Um, I would argue that every database is multi-model because, you know, as developers and DBAs, we define the model. Um, given, you know, let's say an e-commerce application, um, if I ask 10 different you know, developers and DBAs to model that in a database, they'd probably present me with 10 different schemas. Um, so it, it, in that sense, it doesn't make sense. They're kind of all multi-model. Um, but then if you start to you know, kind of pivot and say, well, maybe they're referring to you know, kind of how the data is stored, um, I'll refer to that as a format. And I picked a couple examples, you know, they're kind of positioned in this multi-model space, um, a Rango DB and Orient DB. You know, they'll say, hey, we can be a document database, we can be a graph database, we can be an object database. In a sense, that's true. Uh, but really, I would argue they're a graph, they're a document database uh, because for a graph, edges and vertices are JSON documents. Um, and if you're working with objects, they're just converting those objects to JSON documents. Um, so it's, it's a single format. It's all stored in JSON. Um, regardless of whether your use case is around document or graph. Um, similar could be said of Oracle Database, um, ratio, document, graph. I'm sure if I spent a little farther time, I could probably find them, you know, extending that list to every known possible model. But at the end of the day, it's a relational database and all that stuff is still stored in tables and columns, right? You're going to squeeze your JSON document into, you know, one of the columns in your row, um, or you're going to, you know, squeeze you know, an XML document, you know, into one of the, the columns in that row. Uh, so it just, it didn't feel right, you know, given those two things to really think multi-model is a thing, um, that, there, there, that there's that much meaning behind it. And they all have a single language, right? Um, Oracle Database and ORANTB are SQL, um, the latter being you know, kind, of, kind of trying to get there. Um, and of course, ORANGODB kind of came up with its own language. Uh, for handling these things. So I don't think multi-model is how we should approach the discussion on what's next for databases. But one of the first areas I would look at is multi-API, um, different ways uh, of interacting with the database. And I don't mean just from a client point of view, but that the database itself has different ways to interact with the data. Um, in a sense, I think the underlying format is irrelevant. Um, whether it's relational, whether it's document, whether it's something else. You know, if I'm a developer, all that really matters to me is that I can get the data I want in whatever way I want it. Um, so it could be stored in a relational format, uh, but if I can get access to it as JSON documents, I'm happy, right? And I think there's value in using different APIs for different problems. And part of this is probably my own trajectory when I was a developer. Um, I started out having to do a lot of raw SQL. Um, then, you know, there was kind of this bloom of, of frameworks in Java, 
right? There was hibernate for RM and spring and struts. Um, and of course, you know, hibernate is one of those ones that, you know, I gravitated to. Now we're using, you know, an RM framework. And of course that involves to JPA. Uh, but then as a little bit of time goes on, I just find myself being really restricted and stuck. Uh, it was kind of a little frustrating, yet I didn't necessarily want to go back to writing SQL by hand. And so I think about this a little bit, you know, and how I built applications, and I picked a simple one here just around products, right? I think retail and e-commerce. You know, if I want to view a product, I just want to provide, you know, the ID for that product or the SKU and get the product back. Um, to me, I, I don't really want to write a query however simple it may be. Um, I don't think resources should be spent on parsing that query and then optimizing that query. Uh, it, it just seems like a waste of time for me. Um, and I could probably say the same thing in the navigational sense. Uh, maybe I am you know, getting viewing a product, but I also want to grab all the related products. Um, I don't really need you know, a complex you know, query and execution plan and joins. Um, if I had a navigational database, that product would natively link to its related products, right? And I can just grab them. Um, or graph, you know, much more powerful. That might be a means by which I want to get recommended products. And then, yes, uh, there might be scenarios where SQL is going to be helpful to me. Maybe I want to get top products by rating, so I need some aggregation uh, or some other capabilities. So depending on what I'm trying to do, um, there's different approaches to it, and, and not so much a different approach to me, uh, which I do want to, but I also have, you know, an assumption the database uh, will take a different approach. Uh, you know, I think this is in contrast to some databases where, you know, they present a single language or API, um, but then, you know, the clients is, you know, there's different variations in the clients, right? Oh, if you're in Java, here's four different ways you can use your API. But you know what, they're all converting to SQL in the background because the database only knows how to execute SQL. So it might look key value to you, right? You might have an API that is, you know, table.getbyid, uh, get by row ID, and you, you pass it a number or something. Um, that looks to me like an application developer, like key value. I mean, it's pretty simple and easy, but it's not, right? It still goes into SQL, it still goes through that whole query processing pipeline. Uh, so my assumption, is that I want a database that will actually behave differently for each of these different scenarios and give me the best performance for each one. And finally, as kind of hinted at earlier, you know, these APIs should be independent of the storage format, um, regardless of whether I'm using records or JSON or I want to be navigational or SQL, um, they shouldn't be tied to a specific underlying format. Maybe I do use relations, um, or maybe I want to store binary objects. Um, that shouldn't be impactful. And so, you know, the thought around this, I mean, this is greatly inspired by Mike, I mean, even though you're listening to me right now, I got to give the credit to, to, to Mike and team here at Faircom, is what if we kind of turn this on its side a little bit and made these APIs available directly to developers, uh, whether you're building, you know, backend web applications and services, or you're a front end developer, um, there are a set of APIs available to you. Um, you might spend most of your time in, say, the record navigational SQL, uh, but you have the option to drop down into those database storage or file layers um, if that's what you need to get the best performance. Uh, and then web browser, of course, we'll talk about this here a little bit later, um, they have kind of different, you know, approaches, and those approaches should feed, you know, or tap into, you know, those record navigational and SQL uh, components as well. So I might go through a web browser and REST, uh, which is ultimately, you know, calling some record, you know, APIs. Um, or I might go through RPC and, and specify a SQL query uh, that will go into the, the SQL layer. Uh, but this is where I think we should be looking, um, is, is not the direction of let's take SQL and extend it for every possible scenario. Um, it's already unmanageable as it is, um, and then trying to fudge it to make certain things work with it that it wasn't intended for uh, is, in my opinion, not the right direction. I'd rather go the opposite direction of creating 
you know, really optimized, really efficient, really fast, really simple APIs you know, for different ways of accessing quite possibly the same data. And then I thought there's also a return of embedded databases. Um, so I'm just using my perspective here that you know I would have thought more strongly about these back when we were building desktop applications. Um, or when we think about software that has to run on machines. Um, very popular in commercial off the soft software. Um, so think software that is tailored to specific um, types of businesses. Right? Point of sale systems, you know, they're running the cash registers, or I have you know a dental office and I need you know software for managing my patients and records and appointments, um, or a telco provider needs to handle you know call routing. Uh, these aren't necessarily general purpose you know applications these are built very specifically for one single use uh, and so they tend to have their own you know database that's highly optimized for them uh, but you know i think they kind of have, you know faded away uh, when the internet came and everything moved to web applications we don't have desktop apps anymore certainly not as many um, as we did in the past i think as we moved to web apps we found ourselves uh, with the need for a shared database right now we have lots of applications and they're all pointing to the same database so it made sense to have client server and, and remote but then microservices came around um, and the more i look at it the more i think microservices have more in common with desktop apps than they do with web apps uh, and this will depend you know on how you approach microservices but let's assume that our approach is that each you know, microservice is responsible for just a subset of the database. Right? Our database might have hundreds of tables, uh, but only 10 of them are needed for a specific microservice. And any changes to the data in those 10 tables goes through that microservice. That's the whole point of having it. Um, so we think about you know, data size, well, microservices don't necessarily need to store the entire database, or big it may be. Um, they only need to store a small set of it. Um, they also don't have to contend with other applications. Anyone who wants to modify their data comes through them. Right? They're the gatekeepers. And if that's the case, then you don't need, for example, a second level cache. Right, because your embedded database will take advantage of memory and it's going to cache everything you know the best it can. You don't necessarily need uh, batch processing, so that's kind of one of the reasons we use SQL is that you know in a client server architecture, you know I can't send you know 50 consecutive requests telling the database to do you know something step by step or to process row by row. Um, so naturally, I want to make one request have a whole bunch of stuff happen then get the results but if my database is embedded i could literally just iterate over tables as if they were lists um, or arrays uh, of objects within my application and there's no more network overhead right every read is satisfied locally either from disk or from memory so if i put this together here a little bit you know let's start with two two microservices uh, one for managing accounts another one for managing orders. And I'm going to assume that for the purposes of high availability, we want at least three instances of each microservice. And at this point, we should also assume that we want to replicate any changes um, to, to all of the instances. So uh, regardless of which account microservices you hit, you know, any data that's changed should be replicated to the other two instances. Although arguably you might have scenarios where that's not necessary. Uh, but you know, for now, let's assume that's the case. Operating in this environment, you kind of have the best of all worlds. Um, each, any one of these you know, microservices has access to all the data it needs locally. Uh, and most likely, you know, cache in memory as well. But we might also want them to replicate to you know, a remote database or kind of a, a centralized database in the back end. Um, so when you think about this for a minute, my account microservices, I kept it very simple. You know, they have the accounts table. Uh, and of course, my order service has the orders table. 
uh, but there's probably also an items table and, and some other things. Um, so as I said before, you know, we can start to think about each of these microservices really only needing the tables um, that they own or are dependent upon. While our kind of remote backend database can have all of the tables and all of the data. And we might say, okay, that is where you know, we're going to point our BI and reporting tools um, or analytics, visualization, you know, whatever it might be from, a, I would say, an internal you know, kind of point of view. And then I thought about it a little bit farther. And if I were doing this, I would probably have you know, a couple of proxies in front of each of these. Uh, now, this may not be practical if you have hundreds or thousands of microservices. Uh, but let's just pretend we have a dozen microservices. And in this example, I might choose to have different proxies, right, different subdomains. And what I really like about this is that I could say that my accounts microservice is self-contained, right? It has no external dependencies or points of failure. Um, if that backend remote database goes down, it's not a problem. Right, my microservices have their own database, embedded databases. They keep running. Um, if it comes back up, you know, replication kicks in, and we get it caught up. You know, if any one of these, you know, microservice accounts fails, you know, that's why we have three. Right? There's two other of them out there, and I think it becomes even more impactful if we just start to think about it in terms of containers and Kubernetes, uh, because what I really want uh, out of containers is one, you know, kind of the, this cookie cutter, you know, kind of stamp approach where, you know, each of my microservices is self-contained, no external, you know, dependencies or points of failure, and I can simply stamp out more of them, right? Just make more copies of that microservice to scale that out. Um, and there's no, you know, even dependencies between them, right? You know, the account microservice has its own proxies. The orders microservice has its own proxies. Uh, and so this is an area where, you know, as I mentioned at the beginning, we could probably have an entire presentation on databases and microservices. And to be honest, it's a question we were asked a lot uh, in kind of my past, uh, past lives, right? The people, I would say as early as, I don't know, maybe seven or eight years ago, you know, started feeling the, started feeling questions of, okay, well, what's, you know, as a database vendor, what can you tell us about microservices and, and what's the approach that we should take? Um, and then those those questions, you know, they went from um, a drizzle to a downpour, you know, as recently as maybe, you know, two or three years ago. Um, now it's starting to get pretty heavy. We're starting to really ask, like, what's your point of view? What's your perspective? What's your recommendation uh, for handling databases in a microservices environment? But it tends to be challenging because most databases think you know your oracles and your mysqls and postgres and so on they're not intended to be embedded um, and any embedded databases you might find sqlite and so on they're not intended to run client server uh, so it's a little bit stuck there and then we have to kind of give we have to kind of make up solutions um, as best we can but if you have a database that can run client server or embedded right and you have replication between the two you can really start to think about optimizing data access for microservices. And that, um, one of the reasons I wanted to take a pit stop you know, before we move on is, you know, underneath SQL, uh, we do tend to look in terms of APIs. And, and the farther you go down in terms of those APIs, we do start to work, you know, on a row by row basis. That can be less efficient if you're going over the network. Um, but there's no loss of efficiency when it's embedded. Um, as I said before, you know, a table in my embedded database, um, yes, it's going to be on disk. It's probably going to be cached in memory. And so if you wanted to iterate over that table row by row, um, it's no different than iterating over an object with a list uh, of objects in memory. Like it's super fast. Uh, so there's really interesting things we can do there. <clears throat> So a little tour of, of the database APIs here. I'll start with um, kind of record IO, um, record you'll see me describe it. It's a little bit like key value 
in my mind. Right? This is an API for creating and updating, you know, records. Um, you know, the the record API uh, is something that we're working on. Uh, ORM is one option. Right? You have an, you know, I'm a Java developer, so you can use annotations uh, to handle mapping, or you could have just kind of a raw record, you know, object uh, an API. And in terms of reading records, you know, whether it's getting a record or it's filtering records, um, similar, right? We can take advantage of ORM um, concepts, or we can work directly with, you know, record and filter objects. Uh, one thing to note here is that, you know, indexes are required uh, when we think about records. Right? You have to provide the index. Uh, we can make it easier from an API perspective uh, by ensuring that. You know, indexes are created for you and that the, auto, you know, the right indexes are chosen. Uh, but this is a little bit different from SQL, right? So one of the things that, that SQL does in terms of making it easy for you um, is of course that optimizer, right, an index selection. Um, but one of the things that makes the record API much faster is you can simply tell it what index to use. And of course there's APIs for creating tables and indexes um, automatically through RM, you know, or pragmatically. Navigational, um, this is a superset of record. Uh, so kind of similar concepts, we're working with records, we have CRUD operations, but the difference is we now have the ability to traverse relationships. And I don't necessarily want to confuse anyone with grasp because we'll get to that a little bit later. Uh, but one approach is having each record contain a pointer um, to the location on disk of another record. So given a parent-child relationship, and I'm going to stick with kind of e-commerce here, uh, let's say we have orders, right? as, as most of us probably know, you know, you have an orders table and then you have an items table, right? So we can have multiple items. Right. Well, if my order record, um, it could have a pointer to the first item in that order. Um, and that item could have a pointer to the next item um, and so on and so on. Um, optionally, each item might have a pointer um, to this, you know, the location on disk of the product record, right, which might have the um, description or, or other things that you might need. This is, you know, fundamentally different than SQL, where we think in terms of joins uh, and kind of relational algebra and kind of the overhead uh, of doing that. So this is where you know, navigational kind of sits between record and SQL. Uh, it has some of the speed and simplicity of record, but it's starting to give us a few more capabilities, you know, that we might otherwise see in SQL. Uh, but it's still much faster, right? And if if you give me a record that has pointers uh, on disk to the other records I need, that is substantially faster than having to use indexes and perform joins with relational algebra. And so again, there's kind of a simplicity and performance advantage here. And then we kind of get to the other direction. Um, so the, these two are kind of more for server side, but if we pivot for a minute here and talk a little bit more about front end, we have, you know, REST API. So we should implement the open API spec. You know, everything's going to be sent and received as JSON. And it doesn't matter what your backend storage format is, right? It could be a, you know, stored in relations, right? Tables and columns, uh, but we're still sending and receiving JSON documents. And the paths there um, are probably going to be pretty self-explanatory. Uh, we have this notion of CRUD, and that maps to the different you know, HTTP methods, post, get, um, patch, and so on, um, as well as the ability to filter records, right? Um, and yes, you kind of have to specify the database or, or schema, depending on you know, what database you like to use today, the table, uh, and then either kind of the ID or the index name. Um, so again, this is not quite SQL, right? So when we're filtering, we're still going to have to provide uh, an index name. And then the next one is HTTP RPC. So a little bit different model. Um, and the first one, you know, REST for URLs, where you know the path is the database to the table to the row ID or to you know, an index to use and a set of filter criteria. Uh, 
RPC a little bit more different. Uh, we're still setting and receiving JSON, uh, but instead we have URL and we specify our method within the body. Um, so there's going to be a parameter or a field uh, for the method that you want to run, um, and then essentially the inputs uh, to that method, and that's all represented as JSON. Where it's a little bit different here, uh, is we see support for both the record API and SQL. Uh, so it can look a little bit uh, like REST, uh, where you might be filtering, right? Specify fields, specify you know the conditions and the expressions, or you might pass in SQL queries instead. Uh, you can even begin to work with cursors if you want, um, and much more uh, complete schema management. Um, so we can go beyond creating and viewing tables and indexes to altering and rebuilding them. Um, so really kind of turning over complete uh, management through this HTTP RPC API. One of the things I think is really fascinating in this particular space is also the ability to uh, bundle uh, methods. So when we think about um, database access, we usually think about kind of consecutive runs. Um, you know, send this query, okay, get my results. Maybe I have to do something else, send a query. And when I think about web development, you know, let's say um, e-commerce, I have a homepage. I might want to show my categories, right, to kind of build a menu. I might want to show a featured product, uh, maybe that's on sale right now. I might want to show, you know, popular products in each of my categories. Maybe I want to show some you know, recommendations as a, pers of a part of a personalization effort. Um, so there's multiple you know, queries that have to be made. Maybe instead of making multiple requests, I can make a single request to call multiple queries um, and then get back a result that combines all of those together. Um, so I think there's some really fascinating stuff down the road that we can do with RPC. And then finally, we can look down the road um, a little bit farther than even where we are today. And I think one of those areas that I'm also really interested in is serialization. Um, so yes, you know, JSON became the de facto standard uh, for REST services, right? We know that browsers are sending and receiving JSON. But if we're looking at it from a database point of view, JSON isn't necessarily um, the best approach. Right? There are other you know, serialization options that accomplish mostly the same thing. Right? I mean, if it's binary, it's not going to be human readable, but it could be hierarchical. It's going to be much more efficient in terms of space. And so what if we started thinking about databases in terms of let me choose my binary format? Uh, maybe I want to store, maybe I want to use flat buffers or Avro. You know, it's fairly popular and been around. Uh, maybe message pack, I, I, you know, which has been around a really long time. Um, all of these um, give the ability to kind of serialize objects into very small binary footprints. Um, and they're also you know, cross-platform language independent. And then store those in my database. Uh, and then use either you know, schemas you know, external schemas. So things like flat buffers and Avro, you have to provide, um, you know, for lack of a better word, a schema file. Or you know, if I think in something like message pack, uh, either I could use, you know, one of their, their clients, say the C client, or even look at the specification and involve my own. Um, that would allow the database to then still operate on fields within these, um, whether they're flat or whether they're hierarchical. Um, so I think that is, is really interesting and a place we need to start looking at. And I think it'd still be really easy you know, from a developer point of view as well. Um, you have stronger types, right? JSON has fairly limited number of actual types that it supports. Uh, and I know that you know, sometimes I run into issues around that. It's also going to be really, really fast. And I already have lots of you know, clients out there uh, for serializing to serializing to my objects, whether I'm a C-sharp developer or a Java developer and so on. And so I think that's a place for databases to start looking. And then there's graph. 
Um, and, and there's a lot more to share here, but I'm gonna keep it kind of basic for now. Uh, but if you're already familiar with graphs, um, this is gonna be pretty obvious, but for those of you who might be new, you know, this is the notion that what we're storing in our database are vertices and edges, right? Um, edges connecting two vertices. And it's also a place where we need to start thinking in terms of JSON. Uh, because each of these vertices and edges, they have their own properties um, and they can be complex. And it's going to make sense to use JSON for those. And so, in a sense, it's a graph of graphs, right? Each of those vertices and edges is forming a graph, but within each of those vertices and edges is a graph in and of itself of properties and other things. Uh, and we're also looking at it more from an operational and transactional point of view. So graph is very popular in analytics. Um, I haven't seen it be used as much in operational or transactional use cases. Um, and, and there's a variety of reasons for it, but that's kind of a little bit different here. And these last two, you know, they're kind of gonna help me lead into my next slide, is that ideally, you know, they, these vertices and edges, these are kind of a, a use case, if you will, kind of one of the ways I've modeled my data, I should still be able to use those record navigation or SQL you know, APIs on top of this. Um, conversely, uh, in a perfect world, I'd be able to do graph operations on vertices and edges that were also stored in relations. Um, JSON might be preferred, they could be relations, they could even be in those binary objects that I was talking about. And so this kind of brings me to and kind of the end point is multi-API and multi-format. This, I believe, is where databases are going. This also happens to be what Faircom DB is working on. Because um, we've long had a database with those file storage, database, and record APIs. Um, and then a little bit later, Faircom DB added SQL. We're currently developing navigational putting together the spec for graph. Then if we look down below, you know, we support relations, we support JSON, we're starting to look at how we can support, you know, binary objects through, you know, flat monitors, message pack, Navro, and so on. And I think you see this, you know, kind of many to many here where as an application developer, I should be able to use any of these different, you know, APIs, whether it's record for simple lookups, graph for recommendations, you know, SQL for aggregates or more complex queries. Uh, if I really need to, I can probably tap into those databases storage level, you know, APIs. But regardless of which of those APIs I'm using, it should be independent of how the data is stored on disk, right? It could, could be stored as relations, could be stored as flat buffers. Um, that shouldn't matter. So to me, multi-model is kind of a, you know, either a misnomer or a step in, in the wrong direction that isn't going anywhere. Uh, from you know, a developer point of view, I'm far more interested in multi-IPI and multi-format. Uh, where if I was you know, a Java developer, you know, which I was today, I might like to use the navigational API on top of Message Pack, uh, which is very easy for me because there's a Java client uh, for Message Pack, so it can easily you know, convert my objects into you know, binary form, those can be persistent in the database. The database understands them, knows how to create index on those fields. Um, then I can kind of use that navigational API to walk through them or to query them. Um, but, you know, I might work with a colleague who prefers to use SQL, uh, and that's fine too. So that person can write SQL queries on top of those same uh, binary objects um, that I inserted uh, through message pack. So I think this is pretty interesting in terms of where we could go. Okay, and last but not least, uh, before we wrap up today, we'll do a, a little bit of a live demo. And to provide you with a little bit of context, um, this is kind of a preview of the record API uh, for Java. Um, so Mike has previously done the same for C Sharp with his background. Mine was in Java, um, so I started playing with what would you know, what would the perfect record API look like to me? Uh, so let me escape out of my presentation here. 
And we will jump over to idea. I'm gonna clean this up a little bit. And hopefully my screen is still sharing okay for everyone. And I'm gonna start with, I'm gonna start with my test class. And this will give you, you know, a little bit of idea of what it would look like from no develop perspective, particularly if you were, you were a Java developer, I don't know it would look too different for other languages. Uh, but one thing to note, I am also using Faircom DB as an embedded database. Um, so this is kind of running within my application here. So we start this engine, uh, and then we create a, you know, for lack of a better word, um, a session, which is basically me connecting to my embedded database running within my application. Create database looks fairly simple. Right, I just provided a name, I'm gonna call it DB Catalog. Um, so what I had in mind was an e-commerce website and I'm probably gonna need you know, a microservice for handling uh, my product catalog. And then I wanna create a table to store books in. Right, so I'm a big sci-fi person, sci-fi movies, sci-fi books, sci-fi games. Uh, but I'm also an avid reader, so I have lots of books, and so I need a table to write those in. Session.create table. And then an insert. Um, so I have a bunch of books. You know, I just create these here, start a transaction, and then simple insert record calls. And for each one, I'm providing a book. And then, of course, I commit the transaction when I'm finished. And then filtering. Um, again, fairly simple and straightforward. Uh, so I kind of have this notion of a record filter, and then I'm gonna add um, field filters to it. And this came up looking, you know, find me books with this particular name. Um, probably could also do it by category or you know, greater than a certain price. And then we have session.filter records. Um, it's books that I'm working with, and then probably my filter, and then I get back a list of books um, that are in my database. Similar concept here, um, this time I did it by category. Uh, so find me all books that are in the sci-fi category. And then there's some more you know, compound indexes filtering on multiple fields within it. And then this is my teardown all. So this is right before I, I kind of shut down my application, but I asked to do a little cleanup uh, for unit testing here. So essentially wipe uh, the table in the database and refresh it back to the beginning. But I think looking at you know, these code, that these things are all relatively simple. Um, insert record, filter records, they're not just translating to SQL um, in the back end, right? Faircom DB uh, will kind of operate at a lower level and go straight into that file, find that record I want, and return it to me. You know, arguably, um, in the past, it might have been a little bit more difficult um, to follow this type of approach. Um, kind of if you remember in the presentation, there you know there were some notes that people said, hey, you know, SQL is a lot easier. Nobody wants to have to write you know a lot of code or tell databases exactly what to do. Um, and that's true, but languages have come a long way, right? I mean, Java's come a long way, C sharp has come a long way, JavaScript has come a long way. And so what I have here, in a sense, is really just a, a layer on top of a much more um, complex API which is that database API. So if I go into my implementation here, um, there's a little bit more code here, right? So to, you know, the, the test case, you know, just has this simple create table method, but in reality, I'm using reflection. Um, I'm looking at annotations. I'm gonna, you know, get an instance of a table. Um, I'm then gonna kind of go and then, you know, manually add fields um, to that table definition. I'm also going to go ahead and you know, create that index. It's kind of right here, um, ctTable.index. And then you know, for each field that I want indexed, you know, add a segment. So that it's a little bit deeper uh, in terms of the database and the APIs. But with something like the record API, we can make it much simpler. Uh, we you know, just insert record, update records. And then for reference, 
you know, my book is fairly simple. I just used annotations. Uh, so I have this record annotation that tells it, you know, the database and the table name, um, a list of fields. This is used both for creating tables uh, as well as uh, mapping results, you know, and doing inserts, and then any indexes. Uh, so if we want to index certain fields or index, you know, a certain set of fields, and it uses convention uh, behind the scenes. Um, so given a set of fields, we will have a deterministic approach to giving that index a name. And then when you want to do a query later, based on your filter criteria, we'll find an index uh, with the appropriate set of fields and use it for you. Um, so even though, you know, in the presentation, when we looked at record API, there was a notion of having to provide an index, uh, we can use things like annotations and conventions um, to avoid having to manually specify an index. Uh, so we can do a little bit, you know, what a typical SQL engine might do. Uh, but otherwise, that's it. Right? It looks like a, a normal POJO there. So that brings us to the end of our presentation, and I know we ran late as well. Uh, so I, I'm going to, you know, turn it back over here, uh, and if we have time for questions, we will ask those, but if we don't have time, that's okay. We'll, we'll reach out to you offline. Um, unfortunately, today we do not have time for questions as we are over that one hour mark. Um, but like Shane just men mentioned, uh, they'll be able to reach out to you personally um, later today. Um, so with that being said, Dizan would like to thank Shane for a great presentation. Dizan would also like to thank Faircom for providing the audience with a great webinar. Lastly, thank you to everyone who attended today. We hope you learned something new that will help you in your developer career. Have a great day.